It's time to talk Ohio State football on the Arlads Football Network. And you know what that means. Kevin Noon, BuckeyeHuddle.com, joining us. Kevin, good to have you back again. Great being back. And, you know, it's the perfect time to have you back too, right? Because if the if the Buckeyes weren't in the playoffs, we wouldn't talk to you until, I don't know, maybe time for the draft and talk about all the players coming out. But we get the opportunity to talk now. Just a couple weeks before the uh, semifinals, and uh, that's great. That's great news for Buckeye fans. Yeah, um, honestly, the the morale of Buckeye fans right now is still a little wounded because the last time on the field, it was a bit of a stinker against Michigan. Ohio State does get into the playoffs by way of USC tripping up against Utah in the Pac-12 championship game. And what does Ohio State get but a date with Georgia in Atlanta, Georgia. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of fear and loathing going on right now. But, you know, I think deep down there's always going to be some optimism. And it's it's going to be a hell of a game despite, you know, whatever it is, six and a half, seven point uh, line in the favor of the Bulldogs. But let's not forget, Ohio State up until the Michigan game was considered to be either, you know, the number two team of the nation or 1A to Georgia's yes. one. So, you know, if they can recapture some of that magic. And if you look at just Vegas and what they think, if Ohio State were to beat, were to win their game and Michigan were to win their game, they still have Ohio State as a three point favorite. So that means Ohio State, as far as Vegas is concerned, is still the second best team in the country. Well, and, and, and Georgia got no favors. You're the number one team in the in the college football playoff. We'll give you home field, but we're going to give you this really bad draw. And there was a lot of debate whether or not with TCU losing to K-State in the Big 12 championship game, would they put K, would they put TCU 4 and Ohio State 3, which would, of course, have created Ohio State-Michigan in the desert at the Fiesta Bowl. Yeah. But they didn't end up doing that. So you really do have your marquee premier game with Georgia and Ohio State in that 8 p.m. Eastern slot. And it'll be interesting to, to see what comes out of it. I mean, realistically, though, I, I and I know what they always say, oh, we don't look at this. We don't look at that setup. We don't look at that matchup. All right, whether you talk about it or whether you say or don't say, it's in the back of your mind, whether you want to admit it or not. And there was no way they were going to put Ohio State and Michigan in the in, in, in that first game because they would actually like to avoid it if they could. And hey, if they wind up playing for the national championship, all right, I can we can all live with that as far as the biggest rivalry in all of college football going up against each other for the national championship. Well, I hear you on there. Not my background's television, so I mean television sports production. So I can make the argument on the other side of why not put Ohio State and Michigan in a guaranteed game guaranteed to happen to make sure you look get at, them. Yeah. Look at the ratings that you get for Ohio State, Michigan. The new the, these uh, semifinal games are New Year's Eve, and New Year's Eve games always do a little worse ratings than New Year's Day. So why not make sure that you get the game? TCU and Georgia would still be fine to put in that four o'clock slot and make sure you get the game there and get a gigantic rating. And then if, if regardless, if it's Georgia, Michigan or Georgia, Ohio state, you still have a great game for the championship game 10 days later. But, you know, I understand what they're doing. I don't give them enough credit to say, Oh, well, they're looking at what they're doing. I just, I don't know. I guess I'm a little down <laughs> on on the transparency of the selection committee, but yeah, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe I'm maybe I have the dark cloud over me that everybody else in Columbus does right now too. And look, I I, I, I can completely understand that because uh, uh, again, whether or not, especially if this is the first time anybody is watching me talk Ohio State football, me because this let's just say, hey, Ohio State got, uh, viewers just found this. They've never heard of the channel before. Full disclosure, even though I grew up in New Jersey as a Rutgers fan, I'm a Michigan fan because you couldn't root for Rutgers back 30 years ago. Nobody did. They weren't on television. Um, so full disclosure. Uh, so I know completely about what it what it's like to lose to your rival for all of those years. And there's still a lot of catching up that Michigan has to do. Um, but I would think that this is just me. I, I would feel... Hey, this is new life. This is this is 
people have already discounted us. They've already trashed us for losing at home and said we didn't even deserve to be here because we got blown out at home. Uh, so, hey, nobody, nobody's going to give us a real shot against the, nas- the defending national champs who can't lose to anybody. We can go there. We can play loose and free. And if we do that and we win that, then we get our revenge game against Michigan when we just thought a few weeks ago it was going to take a full year before we were going to get a chance to play them again. Well, it's the old fool me once, fool me twice. And nobody wants Lucy to kit- to pull that football away and for Charlie Brown to go <laughs> careening into, into outer space and then crashing back on his back. But, uh, but yeah, and just to add to the storylines, there was a very – strong rumor going around that Ohio State had told the Rose Bowl if it was going to be in one of the New Year's six games not being in the playoff, maybe maybe don't pick us because enthusiasm wasn't going to be very high, and yeah. Ohio State would have ended up going to the Orange, presumably to play Clemson. And uh, you know, and then, of course, with all the associated opt-outs that would happen there, we oh, wouldn't yeah. have seen yeah. C.J. Stroud, we wouldn't have seen just tick players off the list at that point. So, there is a newfound life, and I think that if we get to 24 hours before the game, 48 hours before the game, people are going to be more excited. They're going to get caught up in the moment. But right now, there's just a lot of fear because of what happened in that Michigan game. But as somebody that I assume watched the game, it was a it was a four-point game going Absolutely. into a certain point. It was an eight-point game midway through the fourth, and then Ohio State had to play desperate, yes. and Donovan Edwards in two rushes had 160 yards and two touchdowns, and it turned an eight-point game into what looks like a bloodbath from 10,000 feet up. But, yes, I mean, that was Ohio not State, a blowout. Yeah. No, no. I mean, Ohio State led at half, but I think everybody in Ohio Stadium at that point knew that Ohio State settling for threes and zeros wasn't going to get it done, that Ohio State was not going to be able to shut Michigan out for, you know, and it, Michigan had whatever it was, 10 points at the half, wasn't going to be able to shut them out at, at length. And and Ohio State struggled on offense in the second half and struggled somewhat on defense. And a lot of choices of Ohio State's offense was predicated by the defense having some making some bad calls. And I mean, I don't put this necessarily strictly on the players. I think that the coaching staff, when Blake Quorum was pulled from the game and everybody and their uncle knew that Blake Quorum wasn't going to be right for this game. And then when he proved it, they were still putting too many guys up in the box and putting guys on islands and they got victimized. And we saw that especially in those two big runs. And that happened so often that's why sometimes when, when, when your team is playing defense, like on those fourth down and one, or, you know, sometimes you're like, you know what, go ahead. I don't really care if they get a first down. Don't do the all or nothing kind of deal at the line of scrimmage, because that's what can happen when you have the all or nothing, you can bust open one of those runs and they did it twice. So, uh, what about everybody talked about the change, uh, Defense has got to be the issue, and, I, and we, we talked about that on our show before the season. They go out and get one of the top defensive coordinators available. Everybody thought, "Wow, the rich get richer." Ohio State goes out, gets you know, spends a lot of money. They're gonna, this is gonna really complete their team, and things just obviously didn't go well in the Michigan game. I'm sure the fans are not very happy. The season's not over, though. It's back to the drawing board. There's another chance. So what does that feel like as far as not just the fans, of course, but following the team? What does that feel like that, hey, you know what? Yeah, we have another chance. How are we going to correct some of those mistakes and make sure that we don't we, we don't leave it back out of the field the way that we did in, against Michigan? Right. And even absorbing the yardage and the points that Michigan put up, Ohio State, 11th in total defense, 13th in, in scoring defense. They were number 23 against the run. They were number 16 in the nation in passing yards allowed. So largely, they were able to make a lot of improvements. Now, people will say the Big Ten was down, and it was. There weren't. There were, certainly were not a lot of elite quarterbacks in the conference. There certainly were not a lot of elite offenses in the conference. But Ohio State did what it needed to until that Michigan game. But you talk about playing fast and loose and having this, this second life, and that was something that 
Ryan Day talked about on Selection Sunday about having this new lease on life. Uh, I, as long as players completely buy into it, because something to remember is Ohio State sat a week from the from really you know from the Michigan loss until Selection Sunday, not knowing what its fate was going to be. I'm sure several players had already concocted their opt out graphics and and you know were mentally already planning where they were going to get ready for the NFL draft who right. or in the combine who's going to train me where am I going to go am I going to SoCal or Florida and then all of a sudden you know scratch the record uh, you guys are in so what you know how quick is the is is the buy in how quick do you buy back into all of this and that's what's really going to happen at this point and there can't be any residual of well, Georgia is just Michigan senior is just a better version of Michigan out there. And we're, we're going to run into the same pitfalls and foibles that, you know, that we saw last time around. So, you know, it, it's going to be interesting. I've always taken an interest in sports psychology and what, you know, what this case is right now. Hell, I could write a dissertation about. Now, this, though, isn't this where coaching comes into play more than anything? It's it's it's. There's a lot of responsibility now on Ryan Day to try and get these guys right mentally. And I don't know what this is going to tell us about Day. We already know his record. We know how how how, how much he's admired around even the NFL. What do you, what, what do you sense as far as this is this Ryan Day's biggest task? This this I got to get these guys ready for this. Is this is this it, it? Is this put up or shut up time almost for Ryan Day to prove how good a coach he is? Oh, it kind of. I mean, it is. I mean, Ohio State can be forty-five and five in its last fifty games, but people are going to point out what Ohio State's record is in games that it's either an underdog in under Day or that it's it's that the talent is equated or things of that nature. And there were people right after the Michigan game. People that I consider generally rational who were calling for Ryan Day's head. <laughs> yeah. So now you get to this game, and if Ohio State loses by three scores to Georgia, it's it's going to be yeah. it's going to be horrible. But I'll I'll throw another scenario at you: Ohio State gets past Georgia, gets to the championship game, and loses to Michigan again. Yeah, I mean it might be that would probably be worse for Ohio State fans so? and for the really? future people than than losing in the semifinals. That's, that's so something else. there's so much there's so much going on yeah. there. Oh, and just throw in too, Ohio State, Boohoo signed a top ten recruiting class, but it wasn't top three. So everybody, you know, all the fans are selling on the coaches and, and feel like they've committed war crimes and are ready to write them off. It, it's just, it, it is predictable though. Uh, you know, I, you see it in a lot of these dynasties and the fan base they get spoiled. We know it. I mean, I know Patriot fans that have turned on their team just like the year after Brady left. It's like, you know, a lot of them, I believe were the younger fans. Uh, some of the older ones who have been through a lot of the losing, they have a little bit more respect and understand what it was like to lose and to not have all the winning. But there are a lot of young fans that are just, especially in Ohio state fans ever since urban Meyer took over. They're just used to winning. We win. That's what we do at Ohio State. Even through Jim Trussell. That, I mean, yes, Jim game. Trussell. Yes. I'm old enough that I re Ohio State went 2-10-1 against Michigan under John Cooper. I, I slowed down my education because I was smart enough to know that I didn't want to get out of school. So I was there for six football seasons. They went 0-5-1 against Michigan while I was an undergrad at Ohio State. I never knew what it was to beat Michigan when I was allowed to wear the fan hat. So I get it. I get it that people who came up in the Trussell era, came up in the Meyer era, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, don't have an appreciation for the fact of it's it's been lean before, but the reality of it is, is the worst season I can think about for Ohio State in quote unquote recent memory is 2011, the year after the departure of Jim Trestle, the year before the arrival of Urban Meyer, yes. the Luke Fickle year, yes. they went yes. six and seven. If six and seven is your low watermark for 40 years, 
And Ohio State really has never been in the tank in the modern football era. Everybody else, Alabama, uh, let me let oh, me yeah. take you to let me take you to the Shula era. Let That's me take right. you to some of that. USC, you guys even aren't even necessarily fully out of yours. Not, I mean, no, that I can go no. on and on yes. and on and on. And Ohio State, you know, treading water is is considered a low point of 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 football history, as I said, kind of in this modern era. So, and I don't like using the word entitlement because those fans out there are the ones that pay my salary. So <laughs> I'm, I'm very careful with the words I say, but there is a, a familiarity with success. And when things are unfamiliar, they become uncomfortable. Good point. Uh Offensive coordinator, Kevin Wilson. So what's up there? So he's going to be the new head coach at Tulsa. That's just going to be after the playoffs, though, correct? Correct. Okay. So you don't anticipate that being an issue at all? It's Ryan Day's offense. Ryan Day is really your play caller. I mean, there is a offensive channel by committee of where things come in, but this is Ryan Day's offense, okay. so it is not necessarily – Something of where somebody new is having to take over play calling responsibilities. Uh, Kevin Wilson is also the tight ends coach. Uh, you know, that is easily enough handled in terms of how they're going to be re reshuffling the deck chairs. Okay. So there's not really going to be a hiccup per se. With this matchup, Georgia, one of the things I noticed with this, look, I don't. I, I know Georgia fans, and 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 I've talked. We, we've had shows about Georgia, and heard their viewers, comments, and so forth. And yeah, they know how good their team is, and they believe their team this year is just as good as last year. But we just know that that's not the case because they lost too much talent, and it's, it just is what it is. They've also had several games this season where they just. Again, it's kind of the reason where you look and not just the Missouri game, but there have been even early in the Georgia Tech game. And there have just been moments where even even a little bit of the LSU game, it's just where I don't know. I mean, are they are, they just seem to be waiting to be beat almost like maybe it would have been better for them to lose. So they understood, hey, we got to do better than this. We just can't expect to go out there and beat everybody that. But, hey, that's the way it's worked out for Georgia more power to them. Now they have this aura now of unbeatability. I, I though suspect, I really do that they're 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 ripe for the taking. I really believe that, and I don't think there's any question. Ohio State has the talent in order to get it done. Question is, do they have the confidence to get it done? <laughs> That's a good question. A question I don't have an answer for. Georgia has to get punched in the mouth. I think that you have to punch Georgia in the mouth and show them show them their own blood. It, it's like when Rocky Balboa punches Ivan Drago and he starts to bleed yeah. from the eye and say, <laughs> see, he's a man. Yes. He's a man. And, and Ivan Drago's like, he's like a piece of iron. <laughs> I mean, you know, so um, Ohio State has to come out and do that because if Ohio State just, you know, jabs and kind of rope-a-dopes or whatever, Georgia's just going to strangle them to death is what's going to end up happening in that game. So Ohio State has to come out quick and put sevens up. I can go back a couple years ago to Ohio State and Clemson in the Fiesta Bowl, and Ohio State marches into the red zone, and the Brent Venables defense forces Ohio State to kick a bunch of threes. Ohio State still seemingly looks like it's in great position to win the game. Sean Wade ends up getting ejected for targeting a – an obvious fumble is overturned. That was returned for a scoop and score is overturned. The points are taken off the board. Trevor Lawrence leads Clemson down the field for a, a late touchdown to take the lead. And then Ohio State cannot convert pretty much at the end of the game with Justin Fields and Chris Olave. The point being is if Ohio State would have put up sevens early, you know, we're, none of that is going to be an issue in my opinion. So they need to come out early. They need to... They need to dictate the pace to Georgia because you're right. Georgia has had its games where whether it was Missouri or even Kent State to a certain point, Kentucky yeah. 16 to 6. Yeah. And I understand that the wind was like 15 miles an hour. It was a little cold <laughs> out. We don't like that. Well, that's not going to be the case sure. at Mercedes-Benz Stadium. But come on, if 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 cold and a little bit of wind, remember Ohio State played in a damn near tornado at Northwestern this year. Uh, if a little wind is going to take you out of your game and you're only going to put up 16 points and 
you know, Will Levis, Will Levis, Will Levis for Kentucky. Get out of here with this first round. Talk to me I on know. that one. I don't understand that I one know, either. I know, I know. But, um, you know, I think Ohio State certainly has the ability, but does Ohio State believe that? Yes, yeah. That that confidence thing is just, I mean, look, we, we saw it with Michigan all those years losing to Ohio State. And you do wonder whether that had, even though it was only one loss, you do wonder whether that had something, that did that come into play at all in the last Michigan-Ohio State matchup? We won't talk about a possibility. That's something to talk about if they do play again, and hopefully we'll get an opportunity to talk. I know you'll be jammed that week if, if, if in fact, there's another matchup. But getting past Georgia, it's still, you got, there's got to be a confidence issue that has got to be taken care of. And it's not that, oh, just get off to a good start. No, 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 no. It's not about getting off to just a good start. It's about for Ohio State, just like you said about smacking Georgia, it's about you know, even if you attack Georgia and you score early, they're going to come back at you. What happens when they do? When you take that return, do you just go into a shell? Visions of Michigan, all that, and the confidence is lost. Or do you play like a champion and you take right. their best shot? I mean, you can't sit there and get up 21-10 and think that 21 is going to be enough points to win the game. Yeah. That's not going to be the case in Ohio State, certainly. And this isn't a Ryan Day thing. I can take this to Urban Meyer, too. They'll sit there and get to a point, and then they're, then they're taking the opponent's best shot, and they get really vanilla on offense, hmm. and they get really predictable on offense. And, you know, I think one of the biggest things here, too, is that Ohio State can't beat Ohio State. Georgia is very good and can beat Ohio State without Ohio State's help. You cannot have pre-snap penalties. You cannot have dumb personal fouls. You can't have a headbutt out of like eight yards out oh, of bounds 30 yes. seconds after a play to get to, to essentially set up a first and 35. You can't have holding calls to sit there and take off a 17-yard run or whatever. Yes. You've got to play smart football. But yeah, you you have to keep firing, and I won't finish the entire line, but from one of my favorite movies, Spaceballs, keep firing blank. You just have to keep <laughs> firing because Georgia, while Georgia is not an explosive team. Now, Georgia can sit there and Kenny McIntosh can house something or Lad McConkey could house something, but they're not a team that is an explosive no, team, no. in my opinion, despite being a team that puts up 39 points sure. a game, something of that nature. that They are much more methodical about it than a team like Ohio State, which is much more explosive, but also can be wildly inconsistent at times. So I'll be I'll be interested to see running game. Uh, what what does Ohio State have to do? Because they have to they have to be balanced. That's for sure. So running game. How does that look in in this matchup? Well, Georgia leads the nation in run defense, allowing seventy seven yards a game. So you have to find something. Um, with Jalen Carter in the middle in that 3-4 defense, it's really hard to run up the gut. Ohio State, though, desperately wants to try and play sideline to sideline, as, as evidenced by a lot of their little quick screens, which fans are going to revolt if they see those again. But, you know, I think you have to come out and be ready to try and do some off-tackle. You need to sit there and have, you know, be able to get out there and have your, have your offensive line get into the second level and allow – Mayan Williams, allow Dallin Hayden, allow these types of guys to get out there and let their ability shine. Because when the Ohio State's running backs are getting hit a yard behind the line of scrimmage yeah. or line of scrimmage, things weren't going so well. And one other thing, too, is Ohio State will be without Trevion Henderson, yeah. as announced earlier. So, you know, they at least they know what their they know what their running back rotation is. But one of the big concerns around Columbus and Buckeye Nation is what has happened to Dallin Hayden? Dallin Hayden has had some big games along the way as a true freshman and then didn't get to carry the ball against Michigan. Uh, what is up with that? Why didn't that happen? Does he fumble 50 times in practice? I mean, what is the concern there? But they're gonna. it's, it's got to be all hands on yes. deck. You can't just sit there and say, Mayan Williams, you're getting 32 sure. carries in this game, regardless if you're getting 8.1 yards per carry or 1.1 yard per carry. You've got to sit there and and change it up. And and guys like Williams, Hayden, and uh, Chip Trainum all do things differently. Uh, C.J. Stroud, uh, what do you think about how 
how did he come out of the Michigan game? And what do you think? What, what, what do you expect out of CJ in this playoff matchup? Well, I, you know, I think he came out of the game. His numbers were still pretty good, all things considered. Uh, but one of the things that's out there is he won't run the ball. He will not run the ball. When he runs the ball, he looks like a baby antelope on on Nat Geo taking his first steps. He is just not a confident runner. But you have to take what is there at times. And I understand that you have extreme confidence in your extreme amount of talent. That is fine. But you have to move the chains. You have to move the chains. You have to keep going. I think that I think Ohio State's passing game is going to be significantly better than any passing game that Georgia has seen. Apologies to Tennessee. Apologies to LSU. LSU throws for 500 yards. I think LSU ran for 50, maybe, maybe 50 in that game. Tennessee, obviously, Hendon Hooker wasn't hurt in that game. You have the Blitnikoff winner, Jalen Hyatt. You got some other things oh, going yeah, on sure. there. But I think Ohio State's passing game is more fully developed than anybody else. But once again, does this turn into LSU and you throw for 500 yards, two touchdowns, two picks, and and run for 17 yards? I mean, you're not going to be able to win that way, but – they have got to impress upon C.J. Stroud that if the run is there, if there is green grass and you can sit there and pick up seven to stay ahead of schedule, do it. Yeah, don't don't just force balls or you know, just chuck it just because you'd rather not run the ball. Um, you mentioned the Tennessee matchup. What happened, apparently, what everybody took from that matchup was – Georgia was more physical, especially with the receivers. Georgia has a really good secondary as one of the best corners in the country. Do you think that will be an issue with Marvin Harrison and the Ohio state receivers? Or do you think they're more tougher? They're more, whether you're going to say disciplined or better in, in just all facets of the game that they're not going to allow Georgia's secondary and physicality to be, to, 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 to knock them off their, their routes and to make it as easy as it was uh, for Georgia against Tennessee. Julian Fleming for Ohio state is a hoss out there. He is a big guy who's not going to get manhandled, but what Ohio state has to have happen is either Julian Fleming or a Mecca Ibuka have to show up in this game. And by, by show up, that's not saying they haven't shown up in other games, but they have to come out and have a big effort. Because if not, you're going to bracket Marvin Harrison Jr. and you're going to neutralize him, and that's going to be that. And then it's just going to be a matter of the other two guys maybe not getting anything done. I mean, you talk about the cornerback for Georgia. Keely Ringo is a, you know, he is a big corner, 6'2", but... If you watch tape, teams go at him, and he's given some plays up. I mean, and it's like you can say, well, you can't defend them all. He's 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 been the fish out there at times. They've they've gone after him, and I think that Ohio State can go after Keeley Ringo. But what they can't do is if Keeley Ringo's lined up with uh, Marvin Harrison, and then he has safety help. Well, I don't know where the heck you're going to go sure. at that point. Yeah. So I mean, you have to kind of figure some things out. But what happens with Igbuka? And with Fleming and with and to a lesser extent with Kate Stover, you have got to have a second viable number yes. one receiving target out there. And that's what's going to happen. And I think all of the thoughts going into the year were when Ohio State was going to have Marvin Harrison Jr. and Jackson Smith and Jigba. Yeah. Who are you going I mean, all right, you can't you can't guard them all. And if you're going to sit there and sell out there, then Ohio State is going to run for eleven million yards. So it's it'll be interesting, but that is really one of the biggest things for me is who is that next receiver? Who is going to give relief to Marvin Harrison Jr. to allow Harrison Jr. to go out and do what he does? A uh, couple of quick things before I let you go, Kevin, and that is uh, Georgia teams like look they have probably the best set of tight ends in the country. Uh, have you noticed that? at all during the season with this Ohio State defense, with Jim Knowles' defense, as far as it either being an issue or a strength or, well, we just haven't been matched up with anything even close to what George is going to throw to us, so who knows? I guess we'll find out. I did something in the story that I'm running 
later in in bowl week, and I don't have it in front of me. Ohio State has done a fantastic job of shutting down tight ends this year, which is atypical for what Ohio State has done through the years. Uh, I could sit, certainly go through some Wisconsin tight ends, some Penn State tight ends, and say that you know Ohio State has struggled there. Ohio State has never had to, well, I don't want to say never. Ohio State generally doesn't have to go after a team that runs 12 personnel that has two hugely talented pass-catching tight ends out there. And that's where the trouble comes because they're so different in what they do. Brock Bowers is fast and dynamic. And then Darnell Washington, I mean, I just did a show earlier where I was like, you know, to Ohio State fans, think about Zach Harrison going out and playing tight end. Well, Darnell (laughs) Washington has an inch or two on him, and they're about the same weight. So that should just give you an idea of what we're talking about there for Darnell Washington. Now, Georgia doesn't utilize Washington a lot, which means look for him to have like 20 receptions yeah. in this game because you you try to break tendency That's or right. whatever. But, uh, you know, it's going to be a challenge. But the one thing I do like is I don't particularly like Georgia's receivers being some sort of point of where Georgia has a huge advantage over Ohio State's beleaguered secondary. Lad McConkey got banged up a little bit in the SEC championship game. Everybody's saying he's going to be okay We'll see. And then they got they got A.D. Mitchell back, who was supposed to really be their one for the LSU game. I think he had a target in that game, but I've been told that he's getting healthier. So will he be able to to, to jump into the offense, and will Stetson Bennett be on the same page with them? That remains to be seen. If Ohio State, and I know you can't look at it this way because Michigan plays first, but if Ohio if if, Mich- if Ohio State fans knew that they were going to beat Georgia, would they want to play Michigan again or TCU, knowing TCU might be an easier opponent? <laughs> I think you're going to find people on both sides of that one. I think that they want to get the payback against Michigan. They want to not have to go through a year. They don't want to have to hear. Let's all right. We'll put the hypothetical machine on and say that Ohio State beats Georgia and then plays TCU and beats TCU. Michigan fans are going to be like, "Yeah, but you didn't beat us." <laughs> and you know, Ohio State fans are going to look, "But we have a giant bronze yeah. lake trophy," and then it, it it goes on and on yeah. and on. Um, there's going to be the section of fans where beating Michigan is everything. It is the beginning. It's the middle. There, yeah. it's the end. There's going to be the section of fans where winning the Natty is everything, and that's what it is. So, I don't. I don't know. Um, I know for me, in terms of somebody that my, you know, my livelihood is based on the best stories. I want to see them play Michigan, but yeah. you know, that's. I've got my own selfish uh, motives there. Yeah. And again, look, as, as a Michigan fan, uh, it's one of those things where it's like, and I feel Ohio State fans probably feel the same way. It's you want to play them. Of course you do. I mean, that's, this is the sports. This is what you live for. But, oh, if, if we lose to them, oh, no. In the national championship, if we lose to them. So that's, uh, boy, that's, but if we beat them, oh, it's the best thing ever. So it is, uh, it's an interesting dynamic. Um, Injuries? Are there any key injuries that we you mentioned? Henderson. Anybody else? Uh, anybody that is banged up that you're not sure of? That's a key player that uh, may or may not play. Well, we obviously know about Henderson. We obviously know about Smith and Jigba. We've also been told that we are not going to get an availability report from Ohio State until two hours before kickoff, okay. which is kind of atypical for how they operate. Um, You know, there are some guys that have been banged up a little bit. Uh, Certainly, Matt Jones left the Maryland game. He did not play in the Michigan game. He is an offensive guard. I've been told he's doing well, but, you know, we shall see. Um, Tommy Eichenberg was playing with busted thumbs on each hand. Uh, We're going to have to kind of see how he's doing. More or less, the team is pretty healthy. I mean, guys, I've certainly been banged up. Mayan Williams has been banged up throughout the year. He tried to go against Michigan. I mean, he made it further than Quorum did, but not entirely yeah. that much further. Um, but there's nothing that's really jumping off the page at me for th- for guys that they were hoping to get back. I mean, there were there were early injuries in the year, losing Mitchell Melton, losing Evan Pryor, not counting on anybody like that getting back in it. Honestly, I'm really not counting on the availability report telling us squat either. Got it. Understand. Uh, how do you feel right now? If, if you had well, to predict or you know feel feel like Ohio State's going to hang with them? I 
you know, we're we're talking so early in the game that I haven't allowed myself to start drinking the Kool Aid yeah. yet or anything. Yeah, by the I, way, we are recording this on the twenty second, twenty second, right of December. Right. So we are two weeks almost away from the game. Right. So I I generally start to come around within about four or five days of the okay. game, but right now. I think, you know, I think Ohio State absolutely can win the game. I think that Ohio State can't play any worse than an A-minus game to, to, to win the game. But sure. even if, sure. you know, if Georgia comes out and plays a B game and Ohio State plays an A-minus game, Ohio State wins. If Georgia comes out and plays an A game and Ohio State comes out and plays an A game, uh, flip a coin. Yes. Um, I think that, I you know, you've got to show me things. And what Ohio State showed me against Michigan was problematic. But what Ohio State showed me against Maryland was problematic. Yeah. They almost... They almost dropped that game, too. So I don't think Ohio State was coming in on a real heater. Um, But I think that Ohio State certainly is going to be able to play this game close one way or the other. I've had several people come at me just to to screw around with me and are are saying that they would lay 14 against them. I'm like, if I had any money, I would take you up on it. But I think think that the line's about right right now. And I'll say Georgia by six or seven. But again... We could we could record an addendum here in eight days, and I, I'm going to be Ohio State all the way at that point. <laughs> well, look, uh, our one of our top sponsors, one of our marketing partners at PlaybookSports.com, has a, a bowl guide out. It's a great bowl guide. I did send it to you, so you have it. And I don't know if you had time to look at it, the Ohio State Georgia information, but uh, for Buckeye, and look, I'm taking Ohio State myself. Uh, they're two to one on the money line. Uh, I'm probably even going to do something there because I think they can beat Georgia. Um, And here's an interesting uh, stat that I think most Buckeye fans probably know. The Buckeyes are 14 and one against the spread as a dog of more than 13, uh, excuse me, as a dog of more than three points. That is an incredible number. Uh, They just, uh, they become a a dog that people think are going to lose a game and, and they do a very good job of either winning outright <clears throat> or making it a closer game than people think. And then throw in the fact that, uh, that uh, undefeated def- uh, national defending champs are just two and five straight up as a bowl favorite of five or more. It is very difficult in this day and age of college football. Alabama hasn't done it a lot to win back to back national championships. And that's something George is also going to have to do. And it's just not easy. Absolutely, and the um, I, the one game that comes to mind where they were a dog and they did not weren't able to cover was the 2020 national championship game against Alabama when half of Ohio State's team was out with COVID more or less. So, I mean that was a bad situation. Trey Sermon gets hurt on the first offensive series, but you know I'll probably, as I said, I'll probably come around. I've got a couple games that I do really like. We're going to get sports wagering in Ohio January 1st. Ohio State plays oh. in its bowl game December 31st. So <laughs> that's just how things work. But uh, in the Alamo Bowl, I really like Washington getting six. No B. John Robinson for Texas in that game. I think that Wash. I, I, I would even be willing to look at Washington money line in that one. And then in the Cotton Bowl, I really like the over at 61 and a half between USC and Tulane. Both USC and Tulane are over machines. Uh, they like six or seven for like USC in the last in the in the last seven games and Tulane somewhere around there too. Yeah, that's an intriguing game because in, you you look at that line initially and you're like, wait, USC is favored by two points against Tulane. They were just almost in the playoffs. I know Tulane's a nice team at all, but but then when you dive into it, you realize that there are a lot of reasons for that, including, just like you said with Ohio State, what would they have felt like if they had to go to play their bowl game and not a, how is USC going to feel? They may not even come to play. This is, this, is, this, is a, this is not a game that they were anticipating. They were hoping to, there might be a lot of disappointment. That's why it's very hard to handicap bowl games, not playoff games, because in those games, you know that you're going to get the, – the, the players are going to be healthy. They're going to play. They're not going to opt out and all that other stuff. And you're getting the best of the best. And uh, that doesn't mean it's perfect science and we know who's exactly going to win and cover. But And I just can't wait for two more years from now where uh, we have 12 teams and we're not going to have to worry too much about uh, – a lot of the stuff that we just talked about with, oh, we're going to have to wonder whether or not if we lose, especially Ohio State, Michigan, playing every year at the last game of the season, usually, especially with the new playoff system meant, well, whoever loses is more than likely not going to go to the playoffs. That's not going to be the case anymore. So I'm looking forward to it. But first things first, let's 
uh, see if Michigan and Ohio State can uh, uh, have a, a, another matchup uh, in January. Uh, they have to get past uh, their uh, respective teams first uh, on the 31st. Kevin, I appreciate it. I know you're real busy. Uh, best of luck covering the team. Best of luck in the game itself. And we uh, look forward to the opportunity to talk to you again. And by the way, your show, when are you going to be talking? Uh, where can we find your uh, Buckeye Huddle shows on air where we can uh, check out what you're going to be talking about? Absolutely. You can find us at YouTube.com slash Buckeye Huddle. My show is The Big Me Kickoff. And then, of course, too, you can find us on all of your podcasting outlets. Uh, we're, we're there. Just uh, check me out at Big Me Kickoff and uh, anything that we do with Buckeye Huddle. I'm going to make it a point then. I'll put the link uh, in the description area of this video so you can make it real easy. You can just click that, and that will shoot you right over to the YouTube page. Uh, and, Kevin, uh, again, good luck. Thanks for doing this. Absolutely.